we started in hard times to bring us all in into the laughter through thick and through thin for public power enthusiasts without I'm Paul Docker, a senior manager of energy resource strategy and planning for Seattle City Lights and an ener energy industry practitioner. And I'm Dr. Almaz Nigesh, a principal resource planning analyst for Tacoma Power and an energy system researcher. And today I'm going to add also an energy justice enthusiast. Nice. I'm Conley Byers, an environmental fellow at Harvard Kennedy School of Government, and I'm enthusiastic about grid decarbonization and electricity market design. I'm Farhad Bilamoria, a director in uh, the Electricity Markets Group for SB Global and a doctoral candidate uh, uh, at the University of Oxford, uh, enthusiastic about market design too. Mm -hmm. On Public Power Underground, we talk about the energy enthusiasm trifecta of electrification, markets, and people. On today's episode, we're discussing transmission's role in the energy system, how it's working, how it isn't working, and ways to make it work better. To get a practitioner's perspective, we're interviewing John Hairston, the administrator and CEO of the Bonneville Power Administration, who is charged with administering one of the four federal power marketing agencies. I'm excited about the conversation. Farhad Conley, transmission's role in the energy system. Any takes? So I, um, in, in preparing for this and thinking about this, I actually pulled up some of the um, the, the textbooks that I had on power system economics and um, two of which I've, I've actually got here, Stephen Soft, uh, Power System Economics, and then a recent one by uh, Thomas Olivier Lautier, uh, Imperfect Markets and Imperfect Regulation. Um, one of the things that comes out as you read these, and these are fantastic, you know, seminal books that, that pretty much anyone in the area should read, um, is transmission kind of receives, it's it's inherent in the way that we think about wholesale markets and, and the focus on locational pricing and, and, and the like really goes into this, this issue of congestion and transmission and losses. But the issue of transmission investment and the economics behind that are, are a little bit more complex. And if you actually look through a lot of these, these sort of original works, they receive much less attention. Of course, there's you know volumes written just about transmission and the like, but it's I think the focus really of the last 10 or 20 years of liberalization of markets has very much been on this idea of how can we get competition in wholesale um, supply uh, generation yeah. and, and retailing. So I think it's it's really good that now that focus is starting to shift a bit. Um, and the emphasis is, you know, how do we actually, what are the economics of the investment? How do we actually um, get this working in a way that, that aligns with what the incentives of participants are? I mean, you just dove right in, Farhad, and we got <laughs> big textbooks for those in the audio medium. They're very thick. Conley, have you read those thick textbooks yet? I've read one of them. I have not read the, the second one. Although I do think I've met the author uh, in Japan once. Even better, even better. Yeah. Okay, what the, the role of transmission? You think this investment scenario is an important take that we need to continue to kind of dive into? Definitely, I think there's a lot of gray literature, right? So like white papers, things like this that are not academic journal articles about transmission. But I think there's this growing interest now, and there's been more publications recently about transmission because. When we're doing all of these macro energy systems modeling and thinking, okay, if we want to have a lot more renewables on the grid, we're going to need to build a lot more transmission, but we're not doing it. And so there's this question of, okay, so what's gone wrong in this process and how might we fix it? Um, and I think when we kind of strip things away from the problem, what we're left with is this issue where the central planner, right? could build a great transmission system as, you know, a regulated monopoly if it had perfect foresight about what was going to be built in the future and when, but it doesn't. And we think because it doesn't have that great perfect information or perfect foresight, we'd like to use markets as a tool for that competitive generation side. But the two of those things together, it's this question of how to get them to play nicely. So we have a sequential decision problem now of does transmission follow generation? Does generation follow transmission? Can you, you know, make generation with some sort of your different kind of risk allocation uh, come first and then transmission follows that. And I think that's the, the question now. A question that's borne out 
through the generator interconnection queue and the transmission service request queue, which we're going to talk more about in short to ground. Great segue. Amaz, did you want to get in before we dive into short to ground? <clears throat> nope, let's dive right on into short to ground. Okay, we're starting out the episode with topical news stories in our TLDR segment we call short to ground. Ready, Amaz? I'm ready. This is Short to Ground, a segment where we blow a fuse covering the news. I'm Paul Dockery. And I'm Almaz. And we're shorting to ground. ground. On Wednesday, February 28th, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission hosted the eighth public meeting of the Joint Federal State Task Force on Electric Transmission to explore transmission-related topics. Guest speakers included Gretchen Kershaw, Senior Advisor for Transmission, and Jeffrey Dennis, the Deputy Director for Transmission, both of which work in the Grid Deployment Office for the Department of Energy. If you missed the webcast, a recording and transcript will be posted shortly. So not ready at the time of this segment. Find a link in the show notes. Friend of the underground Rob Gramlich and his team at Grid Strategies released a report in February titled Fostering Collaboration Would Help Build Needed Transmission. The report draws lessons from a view of successful major transmission expansion efforts. You can find a link in the show notes and you can find Gramlich everywhere, it feels like. Yes, indeed. Uh, Utility Dive published an opinion piece by Will Kenworthy, and I hope I say this name right, Bortha Tan titled Advancing Energy Justice, A New Paradigm in Grid Equity and Reliability Analysis. The piece shines a light on a Michigan Public Service Commission's decision in the 2023 DTE electric rate case to develop a detailed regression analysis of customer demographics and reliability for vulnerable communities to be used in the company's distribution plan case. Um, a decision Kenworthy and Tan refer to as a landmark achievement in measuring and understanding grid equity. You can find the link piece, uh, a link to the piece in the show notes. Nice. The Bonneville Power Administration identified 14 new transmission projects costing an estimated $3.9 billion in its 2023 Transmission Service Request Study and Expansion Process, TSR, Study and, and Expansion Process. Steve Ernst covered the topic in Clearing Up, where he quotes friend of the underground Randy Hardy, saying that the cluster study shows that, quote, BPA has done all the easy stuff and has hit a brick wall. Find a link to Steve's story in the show notes. The Australian Energy Market Commission, AEMC or Commission, has released a draft determination on a flexible trading rule change that creates new arrangements for one, large customers to choose multiple energy service providers for their premises. That's kind of interesting. Two, flexible uh, customer energy resources like rooftop solar, batteries, electric vehicles um, to be separately metered and therefore identified and managed separately from other passive consumer loads like lights and fridges um, in, the, in the energy market. And number three, uh, built-in measurement capability and technologies uh, uh, such as street lights and EV chargers to be used instead of additional meters. So like these- I love this idea. Having this their awesome. own built-in measurement capability, right? Yeah, it's uh, brilliant. I, I like it too, I am, I'm, but I'm, I'm kind of on the fence on the cost versus the benefit of that, but I can be convinced. Uh, the point is to allow for measurement and management of energy use at lower cost. So apparently it's supposed to be cheaper. Comments yeah. close on the draft determination April 11th, 2024, and you can find a link to the draft on the commission's website in the show notes. Standardization, standardization, standardization. I love standardization. Yeah. Next up, the Western Transmission Expansion Coalition announced the members of its Regional Engagement Committee, which will advise West Tech Steering Committee. Friends of the Underground are well represented, including Matthew Shretnik's, Re Shretnik, of Northwest Requirements Utilities, Rob Davis of Grib Alliance, and Tashiana Wangler of Avangrid Renewables. Dan Catchpole covered the story in Clearing Up this week. You can find a link in the show notes. 
spot market power in the Northwest for delivery Friday, March 1st, was at $46 per megawatt hour with natural gas at $1.64 per MMBTU, translating to a spark spread of $34.11 and a heat rate of 28,400. Spot power in the Southwest was at $14.50 per megawatt hour, Southern California at $13.50 and Northern California at $40. 72. New England at 2836, the Mid Atlantic at 2924, and the Midwest at 2424. And we're going to try to start using some grid status uh, graphics when presenting this. Uh, but I grabbed Friday's numbers when I was drafting this. Maybe next time I'll try to grab, grab live numbers from grid status. Wholesale spot prices for NEM, the national electricity market for some of Australia. On March 1st, average it's $92.63 in South Wales, $94.63 for Queensland, $82.44 for South Australia, and $68.63 for Victoria. TAS, whose acronym I do not know, uh, settled at $129.24. Uh, oh. uh, Farhat. Tasmania. Okay, they, they're their own island, right? <laughs> That's right. No wonder there's price separation. <laughs> well, yes. Back to the North American energy market. Henry Hub price, uh, Henry Hub spot prices rose three cents from a dollar and sixty cents per MMBTU Wednesday, February 21st to a dollar sixty-three on the 28th. The price of the 12-month strip averaging April 2024 through March 2025 futures contracts climbed $0.09 cents to $2.81 per MMBTU. According to data from S&P Global Commodity Insights published in the Energy Information Administration's Natural Gas Weekly Update, the average total supply of natural gas fell 1.8% compared with the previous report week. Dry natural gas production decreased by one point. 1% to average 102.7 BCF per day, and average net imports from Canada decreased by 15.5% from last week. That's it for our TLDR segment. Thanks to Public Power Underground's production partners and news data for letting us use their leads. If you want to know more, you can find the complete stories in California energy markets and clearing up. Ready to close it out, Amaz? Do it. That's short, short to ground. ground. Anything, Farhad, Conley, you want to weigh in real quick? Uh, Flex Trader is an interesting one. So this was the recent uh, AEMC rule change or graph determination on this. Um, like, like most things, it has a, a storied history. Um, the, the original rule change on this was 2016 in something called multiple trading relationships, where basically, so the idea really around this whole thing is where you could have, um, as a consumer of electricity, multiple retailers for different parts of uh, your usage. So you could have, you know, one retailer for your pool pump and, um, Seriously? and, your and maybe another for, you know, your regular uses. So it's, it's kind of a, yeah, it's sort of a very. Um, um, so it's like segmenting by like use. So you could have a vendor that just served a whole bunch of like pools, pool load across Australia. Right. And you could like Correct. specialize energy yeah. service for pools. That, that was the idea. Yeah. That's the so, idea. So that was kind of where it came. The original one didn't go through. Um, 2016 was kind of, I think um, it seemed uh, that, yeah, if for one reason or another it didn't go through. Um, and so this time the, the commission has approved a, a slightly different version of this. So what's happened is they've approved it for, cons uh, for commercial large scale consumers. So they can now have multiple relationships but you could, as, as in the new segment, it sort of had, it, there's a little bit of a granularity with residential because what they can now do is your EVs and other parts of your usage profile can be separately, not necessarily metered, but, but you can actually track the usage profile. And so you could be managed differently. Um, so it's not the full way, but it's, it's a step forward, I guess. Fascinating. Yeah, I love the inbuilt metering or measurement capability. Love this idea. Awesome. Conley, anything you wanted to weigh in on the stories and short to ground? Sure, I'll echo the Rob Gremlich recommendation, that new study looking at big transmission projects in the U.S. and the kind of collaboration and data sharing that was necessary to make them happen, I think is a really good read.
Awesome. Amaz, any of those stories that stood out you wanted to weigh in on? Well, just I'll say the the utility dive article on uh, Michigan Public Service Commission's uh, rate case sounds a little bit like something that Tacoma Power has done looking at um, our equity index and overlaying that with some of the reliability um, in our service area. So uh, thought that was interesting. And harken back to our interview with on People's Energy Analytics with Destiny Knock and the work she is doing on understanding energy equity gaps uh, with Xu Chen Kong. It made me wonder if she was somehow involved in this because what they do isn't a regression, but it's algorithmic. Um, did it make you wonder, Almaz? It, it didn't, but now that you said it, it does. Good. <laughs> This week, Crystal Ball is joining me as a special correspondent for an interview with the administra administrator of the Bonneville Power Administration, John Hairston. John was named administrator and CEO in January of 2021. In this role, he's responsible for managing the nonprofit federal agency that markets carbon-free power from Columbia River hydroelectric dams and the region's one nuclear power plant. BPA also operates most of the high voltage power across the Pacific Northwest, distributing renewable energy to the region and beyond. Crystal is a regular contributor and executive producer for Public Power Underground. She is the executive director of the Pacific Northwest Utilities Conference Committee. When we return from the interview, we'll discuss John's perspective, see if it updates our priors, and update any of our grand analogies of the energy system based on this perspective. But first, a word for our, from our sponsor. Public Power Underground is sponsored by the Energy Authority. The energy transition is upon us, and if there's one company who has public power's back, it's the Energy Authority. TEA isn't just any sponsor of the show. They're the backbone of what we stand for, keeping the power in the hands of the people. With offices in Bellevue, Washington and Jacksonville, Florida, TEA has coast-to-coast -coast expertise in energy trading, RTO management, portfolio management, advanced analytics, renewable energy, and much more. As the energy industry evolves, so does TEA, staying on the cutting edge of technology to help their 75 plus public power clients maximize the value of their assets. When you partner with TEA, you're not just keeping up, you're leading the charge. Learn more at teainc.org. That's T-E-A-I-N-C.org for more. Hey, John, welcome back to Public Power Underground. Well, thank you, Crystal. Nice to be here. Well, yeah, good, good to, to have you, you back. Again. Yeah, yeah. Third appearance, I think. Yeah, the trifecta, right? The trifecta. <laughs> oh. Yes, we had the recruiting pitch. One of my favorite episodes. Uh, the recruiting, the recruiting pitch you did at NWPPA. Oh, and yeah. we had a wonderful conversation with Matt Shretnik and you and me. It was great. Yeah. Yeah. And, and now we are we're back. Again. Yeah, we're gonna get into it. First up, though, is this season on Public Power Underground. We're focused on getting practitioner perspectives on policy and research topics. And one of the core questions we have is like, what are the areas of enthusiasm that our practitioners in the industry have? So, John, what is what's your area of enthusiasm in the power sector? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, that's a great question. And, and I, I'd like to think of it as in areas. Because areas, it, multiple. Yeah. You've had um, a long career. Yeah, it's a long career. <laughs> But a lot of just a lot of great things are happening right now. Yeah. Um, you know, for me, what's um, I really get enthusiastic about is what we're doing around transmission. Um, you know, it's obvious that not only the region but nationally, we need more transmission infrastructure. And you know, here at Bonneville, um, having 85 percent of the high voltage transmission in the Pacific Northwest, uh, we're really excited about adding to that, about growing that infrastructure, um, growing the green energy, um, you know, future. And so, you know, we see ourselves as being central to that, and the investments we're making also being central to. Um, you know, growing that green energy future. So I'm excited about what we're doing. Yeah. And we've got new projects and we're also trying to make it a little bit more efficient for folks. Um, you know, if you look at what we've experienced in the past uh, with um, the generation interconnection queues, yeah. uh, that everyone is experiencing big across the country. Everyone's yeah. experienced the big, same thing, right? Big, yeah. So, you know, big lines here. So we're doing some great stuff there. I'm, I'm happy and enthusiastic about that. And then the other piece is just our people. Yeah. Um, you know, we rolled out our strategic plan, and, and the centerpiece of that is um, really valuing our people and making sure we have the right workforce, the right size, the right skill set, and creating the right environment for them is something I really, you know, am enthusiastic about. I want, I want to 
thank you for bringing those two up and also just like reflect back. Every time I've talked to you about transmission or people, you have brought the enthusiasm. So this is really <laughs> authentic that the, like, because you really do seem to light up when you talk about transmission. Yeah. And one of the thing I've heard from like my interactions with your staff are how supportive you are of your team around like supporting their decision making, engaging with them, making them feel like they're like you're supporting them and their leadership. So mm-hmm. I hope you hear that from your staff. I hear that from your staff. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Well, you know, consistent with what I tell them, the only thing I could do in this job by myself after day one is fail. Um, You know, I count on our staff, um, our talented workforce to really achieve the goals that we achieve each and every day. So, um, yeah, that would be right in line with how I feel about them. Yeah, good. Which is good. So it part is. of what we do here. Well, and yeah. make people feel good. There's a lot of great people that work at the Bonneville Power Administration, and they are really making a contribution to the region every day. So, oh it's yeah, great. yeah, and even when they leave Bonneville, they continue to do that, uh, right, Crystal? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, John. Yeah. There's a Padum Tish over here. There we go. Let's see if that comes through. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Well, as everyone knows, I am an electric utility enthusiast. You are. Yes, yeah. yes. Um, and so it's great to be invited uh, here to talk about electric utility enthusiasm. Um, and I'm glad you mentioned transmission. It's something that I am passionate about and trying to bring people together to address. Um, but, you know, John, you were mentioning it. Um, BPA is moving forward with $2 billion worth of transmission system upgrades uh, that will increase capacity accommodate regional growth, and connect new renewable energy projects. And then later um, this month, Bonneville will publicly review uh, the latest transmission cluster study, uh, and that study could result in additional transmission upgrades beyond that $2 billion commitment, uh, and even possibly new high-voltage transmission lines. Uh, So we hear that uh, these projects are designed to take a long view of transmission needs over the next two decades. And uh, as you mentioned, it's an area of enthusiasm for you, but we know that BPA can't go it alone. John, my question for you is, what do you think is the best approach for developing transmission solutions that address rapidly changing energy demands and future grid requirements? Yeah, you know, that's a, a really great question and, and timely in terms of, you know, what we're seeing in the industry right now. Um, you know, you're right. We can't go it alone. Uh, we have to be able to work with our partners. And for years, you know, we've always focused on, uh, I think, things regionally um, yeah. and, and rightfully so. But now that we've seen um, there's really a lot of advantages to diversities in the system, um, you know, it's it's really important for us to work with others, not only within the region, but extra regionally. Um, you know, a couple of things come to mind for me. Uh, one, you know, the work that we're doing on our interconnection queue, uh, I think is important because, um, like you say, you know, transmission interconnection, transmission investments have always been long term. And for a period of time, um, it was really frustrating. Folks were seeing, you know, projects maybe come online in 15 years. Mm -hmm. And so we felt it was important to be able to address the timeliness of that. And we focused in on um, some reforms Mm -hmm. on our interconnection queue. And we were able to get those through um, with our customers' um, help. And I think we've got a good path forward in getting projects now you know, online a lot quicker. So I I think that's important. But that took a collective effort. We couldn't do that by ourselves. We had to work with our customers to understand what were the pinch points, what were the important things we needed to do policy-wise. And and so I think that is going to create space for us to move forward and begin now to work on the investments that need to be made together. Yeah. Yeah. And and part of that is, um, you know, something um, you, you talked a little bit about, I think, earlier. Um, we were able to work with the Western Power Pool and standing up a new kind of view of long-term transmission planning. Yep. Um, the Western Transmission Expansion Coalition, West Tech, uh, is something that, um, you know, we talked about in concept saying, you know, let's move from the 10-year kind of planning horizon to something more along the 20-year horizon. And then also, let's be more inclusive. Let's look beyond just the northwest borders. Let's look into the southwest and see, you know, where there might be some partners for us to begin developing projects that will allow the diversity 
to allow us to get, you know improve reliability, but also get folks who are willing to step up and you know quite honestly cut the check when it comes time to uh, pay for these types of projects. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing about that uh, coalition uh, is expedient. And uh, really looking at uh, the existing studies uh, to leverage uh, that work, um, but to do something you know rather quickly uh, that really addresses what we think we would need uh, for the future energy grid. But you hit on it um, different. Let's do something different than what we have been um, doing. Uh, let's do something that's inclusive, uh, that includes people that uh, hadn't maybe been involved before oh, yeah. or didn't feel like they were uh, uh, listened to. But really, you know, get that group together, build that coalition and develop something uh, that uh, would look further out than what we do right now. And uh, I think we're all very optimistic that it's really going to result in some actionable uh, transmission solutions and that it will be based on a broader regional consensus. I'm really excited about it. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, if you look at the landscape, there's so many different entities now involved in resource development. And, and that's great. You know, there's a focus on renewable resources, and there's a lot of opportunity for folks to get into that ball game, develop them, but then they have to get them into the system. They have to connect them so you can get those electrons from those plants to the household. And, and you know, that creates a much broader coalition of folks who have to work together to make all of that work. Um, you know, we've found over the past few years that when you're not working together, yeah. when you're yeah. doing these things in silos, well, it doesn't come together in a timely fashion. So you're right, Crystal. Or if ever at all. Yeah, if ever at all. So you're absolutely right. Um, I think this effort around West Tech will not only allow us to bring parties together, you know, regulators, tribes, um, customers, generators, um, et cetera. Um, it will also allow for us to be able to say, okay, we can get this stuff done a lot faster and on a large, much larger or broader scale. So I'm excited about that also. I I'm glad to hear the excitement, but I do want to kind of get back to how heavy the task feels, mm -hmm. right? Because we talk about the long generator and connection cube. We also, uh, Crystal mentioned, uh, by the time this gets published, the, the uh, Bonneville have already hosted this transmission service request, cube process and results. Um, that also speaks to volumes of transmission service being requested. And it feels like, like the challenge is like heavy. The challenge is heavy. It feels like a super huge challenge. And I want to like bridge the gap. Uh, do you feel hopeful? I mean, you you experience it, right? This chair is in a lot of ways responsible for the largest transmission network in the Northwest and bears the burden of transmission service and delivery of power. Do you feel hopeful in light of the, wor the work we're doing now? Do you think what what changes what the work we've been doing to the work we're doing now that gives you as much hope as you appear to have <laughs> well well thanks and you know you were killing the vibe a little bit I know. but i got <laughs> i know <laughs> but i um, it feels really heavy <laughs> yeah well, i did I, I, think, I think we need to acknowledge the weight of that though mm -hmm. right it because is. it does it's a heavy lift. it is a generational lift yeah it is a generational transformation and that is a big challenge it is and you know um the one thing i've experienced over the 33 years I've been here at Bonneville and just being part of this industry is that, you know, generally when there is a challenge, the people of this industry stand up to that challenge. Yeah. They rise to it. And you look at, you know, when Bonneville first started and was building transmission, that was a huge challenge then. Yeah. You know, uh, rural, rural electrification was more than just an easy task. It was nope. something that folks really had to work at and they had to do it collectively. The whole region worked together to get us to where we're at today. And now we're seeing that next stage, that next step we have to take to meet the goals of uh, electrification, you know, to make sure that we're, you know, reducing carbon content in how we're producing electricity. And, and all I'm seeing are folks willing to take those positive steps and rise to that challenge. So when I talk to our folks in our transmission organization, and I'll speak for Bonneville, I think they're ready. Um, they're just ready to roll up those sleeves. They're looking for the resources to get going. And we're looking to build some transmission. We want to be you know, the, the vital component that folks rely on uh, in the future. And I, and I think we're going to rise to that task. Yeah. I, sorry, I, I see a lot of alignment 
Uh, so that's what makes me hopeful. Okay. Yeah. Is, uh, you know, we started talking about this idea uh, and the more we talked about it, the more that we recognized that there were other people who had common interests. Uh, we, you know, talked with states, as you um, mentioned, and they were, uh, I think, eager to align uh, with this coalition to, right. because they were also hopeful that this coalition could get something done. It, to kind of speak to the scope, though, and I, I think in order for Bonneville to rise the occasion, it has to be armed with the goods to deliver, right? And you spoke to the people, mm-hmm. and you spoke as part of, like, your areas of enthusiasm, making sure that you have the right people. There's also, like we mentioned in uh, the lead-up to this question, the $2 billion of transmission investment. That's good. That is helpful. But there's also more needed than just the $2 billion, right? We're talking to meet the challenge, a considerable investment. Like, is there anything you would highlight for, and this is uh, like in the season, we're bridging the gap of like practitioners and stuff. Is there anything on the scope that you would try to inform people of like how big of a lift is up in front of us around people and, and investment? Yeah, so, you know, I first I wanna acknowledge, you know, what Crystal said, right on point. I think there's much broader alignment now that exists today than there were before and the resources. Um, you know, Bonneville is fortunate to get an increase in our borrowing authority. Um, that's given us much more flexibility to even think about these types yeah. of projects that are necessary, where before we were really focused on, you know, non-wire solutions, kind of the low cost option, um, just to kind of put the bandaid over it and, and get through the challenge. Um, now we can think a lot more broader and that alignment reaches all the way from say the delegation who, you know, said, let's give Bonneville um, some additional borrowing authority through our customers, through, you know, the um, utility uh, commissions. Um, you know, you, you even see the tribe, tribal governments now, um, you know, beginning to participate in these discussions. So there's a lot more alignment, I think, through, you know, throughout the industry. Um, for us, you know, in terms of the lift, uh, we do have to bring on, you know, a number of new resources, engineers, engineers. in particular. It's really um, hard right now. Yeah, it's really hard. Yep. Um, and, you know, particularly for Bonneville, being federal and in and, and really under that federal pay scale, sometimes it can be challenging to recruit folks because, you know, when you're recruiting against private industry that has a lot more flexibility in their compensation packages, um, oftentimes folks decide to go that route. Yeah. Um, but what we're finding is that the talent we're bringing in, um, not only are they really talented and great um, you know, resources, but they also are here for the mission. Yep. And, and that's equally important because that's where you, as you say, you get the folks who are dedicated and ready to rise to that occasion. Yeah. Wouldn't it be better, though, if you also got people who are dedicated to the mission and you could also pay them well? Oh, yeah. That'd be great. Yeah. And, and we we're working. Yeah. And we're working hard, <laughs> you know, to um, try to get a little bit better compensation for our folks. Good. Yeah. I think you're up. OK. <clears throat> well, switching gears a little, uh, according to a Princeton University project, failing to accelerate transmission expansion could severely limit potential wind, solar, and energy storage projects and forfeit emissions reductions that might be achieved under current policies. Uh, It's one of several white papers, reports, and journal articles, so lots of writing and thinking uh, that have shown similar results. In fact, Professor Jacob Mays, who listens to this podcast. A friend of the underground. Jacob Mays, friend of the, friend of the underground. <laughs> he shared with Paul that he's working on a transmission-related paper, too, and that will come out uh, this year. But as Bonneville administrator, which, as Paul uh, you know, really highlighted here, undisputed main character in the transmission drama here in the Northwest. What advice do you have for policymakers or researchers, um, you know, academics, who are diving into uh, the transmission topics? Yeah, so uh, really, really good question. You know, I think the experience that I've had with, um, you know, working with the power pool and you, Crystal, and a number of folks on West Tech, um, you know, the input that we've gotten is that planning is important and to expand that horizon is equally important. So, you know, looking long term is great. Uh, But if you go back in history, we've had some really good planners. Uh, We've had entities that have done great jobs planning. And I would suggest that, you know, 
a lot of the things that we see in terms of potential projects are things that have already been identified. But if I was really to say there's an area of focus to researchers or if they're looking to move the needle, it would be around, I think, permitting. Okay. Um, you know, looking at how quickly we can get per- permitting for these projects, because oftentimes we all have the plan, but then you have to go through the process of getting the approval, the, yeah. the permitting um, to, to move forward. So I think that's going to be important in, in trying to figure out how do you set up policy to address that. Absolutely. I think the other piece of it is, you know, you, 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 once you have the permitting, then you have to have folks who are willing to write the check, right? Yeah. So cost allocation and, and, and maybe looking at how we model that moving forward is important. Um, you know, I, I, I talk to a lot of entities, a lot of CEOs who uh, want to uh, move forward on projects, uh, but it's a matter of just getting the right group together to do that. Yeah. But if we could be a little bit more, I think, deliberate in how we address cost allocation, I think that could actually spur a lot more growth than what we're seeing today. Yep. And we know the states are exploring uh, cost allocation, at least the Western states, uh, through their transmission working group. Uh, and there are a lot of uh, regions uh, that uh, have cost allocation um, methods uh, that we can look into. Uh, but it's really like, how do we get together to get things done? Right. Yeah, we got to plan, build and synchronize the transition. Obviously, the sisterhood of the traveling yeah. electron going on right here. <laughs> yeah. uh, I wanted to I wanted, I wanted to revisit permitting a little bit mm-hmm. uh, in in the research space. W- one of the interviews we did last season was with Professor Destiny Knock at Carnegie Mellon, Mellon and she uh, did some work around like the social sciences aspect of planning and the social sciences aspect of big projects. And I actually wonder if that is one area of research that um, we need a lot more of in our industry, the understanding, the social science solicitation of input, that kind of work, and uh, whether Bonneville is going to be recruiting more philosophy majors and, <laughs> uh, and psychologists <laughs> and, yeah, uh, and that kind of yeah. stuff. Because I actually, to get to the permitting thing, it is... I used to, I was a developer for a little bit at Next Air Energy, and transmission lines are really hard to build and really hard to permit. Um, and I think you spoke to it first, and I think that's really insightful that that work is actually really important, and advancing research in that area could be really important. Is that is that vibing with you? Does that that make yeah, sense? Yeah, no, it, it does. You know, it's um, no one really wants these you know things built in their backyard, right? Yeah. Uh, one and then two. You, you want to make sure that there's equity about how you're making these investments and where you're making these investments and how they're impacting people. Um, you know, it's no surprise that, you know, folks who are typically on the lower end of the social ec- economic ladder, um, you know, bear the brunt of a lot of the, yeah. um, you know, investments in where things are cited, whether it's freeways, whether it's power lines, you know, airports. Uh, you just look through history, you know, entire neighborhoods have been moved to accommodate, um, you know, structures or uh, public investment. So I think it's really important that uh, researchers try to figure out how to, you know, approach this on a more equitable basis. Yeah. And, you know, what are the, what are some of the trade-offs here? Uh, what are the things that we can do to improve, um, you know, the human condition while we make these investments? Yeah. Um, I, I do think the industry is moving in the right direction along those lines. Everything I see is tended to move towards um, social justice um, and also looking at how do we improve the environment. Yeah, uh, This is a great industry to be in when you look at, you know, if you want to address climate change, you want to address, um, you know, carbon reduction, all of those things. This is um, a great industry to be in. So uh, it, 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 you know, continues to make me excited when I come to work to know that we have an impact in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. Paul, I'll add, you know, there's a lot of examples of where it went badly. Yeah. And uh, we could learn from that. Yeah. And we know that it in involves uh, including people uh, from the beginning uh, and listening. And I hope that's what we're able to do uh, through the Western Transmission Expansion Coalition. Uh, One thing on that, um, we've talked a lot about new, uh, but I do think that the coalition will be looking at how do we get the most out of what we have now. 
So that's how a do we transmission get explosion. the most? How do we get the most <laughs> with some gets? Uh, that's nice, nice pun. Not intended, but it was there all along. Yeah, no, uh, I, I think um, in the permitting, planning, and paying for, our industry has a lot of people who are really good at the planning and the paying for. Like, that's our skill set. Mm -hmm. But the permitting and the social science aspect of it is maybe where we have blind spots in our industry as an industry of engineers mm -hmm. um, and business people who will figure out how to pay for stuff, good financers. Yeah. But the permitting is a social sciences problem. But yeah, we get we can get, get. more out of our existing <laughs> transmission, which can save us uh, more. No, I, uh, anything else you want to add? No, I think that's right. I you know it's. Um, you know, it's certainly something that I think as as we progress, I, and you said blind spots, I, I tend to look at it as, um, you know, there's there's a good awareness, but now there's more sensitivity to it. Because even, okay. even then, we weren't blind to the fact that this was going to have an adverse impact on someone. We just didn't care. Yeah, We seem to care more now, which is important, yep. and it's something to build off of. Yep. Well said. Yeah. Well, I'm going to transition hard to uh, energy system analogies and a game we're playing on Public Power Underground. <laughs> um, and at the end, after we cut recordings for this episode, um, I'm going to have you rank some analogies that our hosts did. Um, but first, part of part of what we're doing is building a field of energy system analogies that are going to compete in our season finale in a, what I call ESSA World Cup, similar to the <laughs> FIFA World Cup. Um, yeah. But we have to build rank out uh, by by um, rank choice voting our field for our season finale uh, uh, bracket. So um, as part, like as guests on Public Power Underground, you get to submit analogies into this field. Um, and so we're going to rank the existing ones after this. But first, do you have an analogy for the energy system you would like to submit to the field for the energy system analogies World Cup? I do. You do? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. I do. Okay. And, what do you got for us? Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of think out of the box a little bit. You That's know, we love, we love this. We love um, out of the box. And you know, the other piece is, you know, I anyone who knows me knows I, I love playing golf. Okay. And so we're going to have a golf analogy. This I good. think we're going to have a golf analogy. <laughs> I think we are. Um, you know, I tend to look at kind of the, the system as, um, you know, if I were playing golf, I would consider myself the power plant. Okay. You know, and you or any golfer or any golfer, Okay. you know, and, and when I step up, I look at the ball as the electron that okay. needs to travel. Mm. Okay. And so as the power plant, I have a club, the driver. Mm -hmm. The driver to me is the high voltage system. Okay. Because when you whack it, it's going to go far. But if you have you a, the, the driver, the 500 kV line, it's yeah. a bigger club. Right. Okay. And so you hit the ball with the driver down that 500 kV line. Okay. It rests. Then you go up and you're about a you know, 150, but if, if you're me hitting the ball, you're about 110 out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> then you step down the club, right? Yep. So, like I said, most people hit a seven iron. I'm going to hit a, a pitching wedge. Okay. I'm but, getting, you're very good at golf. <laughs> I'm getting this analogy. That's good. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm going to step it down a little bit. Okay. Okay. Uh -huh. All right. To, to kind of the, the, the neighborhood Okay. Um, size, uh, you know, voltage and hit it to the green. And when I land on the green, I'm in the neighborhood. Yeah. You're in the neighborhood. And I pull out the putter, which is stepping it down again, uh -huh. you know, to distribution. And I'm going to put it and the ball rolls that electron right to the house. And bingo. Bingo. Light switch. Light switch on. I love this analogy. It's really yeah. good. And, you know, the nice thing about it is that I look at the fairway as a right away. Okay. And, you know, you, you need to stay in there right away. If you start deviating out and get in the trees, you're going to have some problems, right? Uh -huh. So, and you also have to be a pretty proficient golfer because that adds to reliability. If you're able to do that over and over again, you're going to have a reliable system. If you keep hitting the ball over in the trees or off the right away, not so reliable. Losses. Yeah. 
Lots Losses. of losses. Yeah. Yes, I love it. <laughs> Outages, <Perfect>. you know. <laughs> so that's my analogy there, and I'm going to stick to it. And like competency in golf is being able to replicate your, replicate. your swing, replicate your swing. And that's oh, yeah. so much in our industry is about just yeah. Yeah. delivering, yeah. delivering, delivering know? results. Being consistent and, and being safe. Yeah. Right. You know? Yeah. There's a safety element. To so it. what's the sand trap in like in the power system? Oh, the sand trap. Let me see. That would be, that'd be interesting. That's like a snowstorm. Oh, a weather yes. event. You yes. Know? A cold snap. Yeah. Yes. You know? Yes. And it could actually, um, you know, depending on how good you are getting out of there, you know, the price of getting out of that trap could be very high. <laughs> Yeah, and we know that yeah. actually. That yeah, I feel that actually. <laughs> Getting out of the snow stuff can be very expensive. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, I, so. I, this, this is a good analogy submitted into the field. I agree. Yeah. 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 Well, yep. um, do you, do you have one too, Crystal? I know. Well, I do. You but do. man, after that one, that's 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 going to be really hard to beat. Okay. All right. Depends on who the, the rest of the voters are. I think. True. You know, the, I, and that's oh. why I don't know about this one, but uh, talk to. Paul a little bit about this one um, and have tested it on some people, including my daughter and her friends. Um, but my analogy is this, the electric sector is evolving like the eras of Taylor Swift. Oh. Mm -mm -mm. <laughs> I, 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 I don't have a good enough button to respond, to react to that. It's good. It's good. You need that yes. one with Taylor Swift. Like, I don't know. <laughs> what is that? You know? Yes. We're getting to it. We're getting to it. Yeah, okay. I yeah. will help you. I will okay. help you. Uh, so Taylor Swift, she debuted as a country music artist. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, it was uh, for really a niche audience. Um, oh, I mean, th that was my, I was, I was the audience. Okay. Maybe I am a niche audience. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. All right. Well, play with me here. Okay. I'm here. All right. Um, the energy transition debuted at the federal level mm -hmm. uh, with uh, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission Order 888. Okay. So, you know, it's something that people in the industry know about, but not well understood okay. or very popular, Right. It was when Taylor Swift crossed over to pop music that really she grew in popularity. And it was that crossover that propelled her musical career. And I say when the energy policy reforms crossed over to the state level, that's when awareness about the clean energy transition grew okay. and became more well understood. Um, and it was really Taylor Swift's hit, We Are Never Getting Back Together, that really put Taylor Swift on the map. That was 2012. She was cemented as a popular music artist. And, um, you know, people know that song. Mm -hmm. And I think it foreshadowed um, where energy policy was going at the state level after that hit in 2016, Oregon Governor Kate Brown, she signed landmark energy policy legislation here in the state of Oregon that eliminated coal power from PGE and Pacific Corps um, service to Oregonians. Mm -hmm. And it was really that landmark energy policy that ensured the breakup of PGE with coal. After that policy, we knew PGE was never getting back together with coal. Oh, nice. <laughs> nice. That's good. Keep going. Do you have more? Yeah. That, good. That, that, that is outstanding. <laughs> <laughs> that wins uh, at least think, at some sort of yes, consolation Yes, I, I hope you have the song queued up for that. We can't use it, though, because we will get oh, sued. Oh, true. And we, we are going to do that. Well, would you like me to gonna, sing it? it? That would be great, actually. That would be great. Never, ever getting back together. Never, ever as, getting back together. It, one, of, one of the ways of understanding our industry, I think, is the history of our industry. Mm -hmm. And so I really like the eras of Taylor as a way of understanding yeah. the electric sector because – so much in Bonneville being here in the administrator's office, right, underscores this point, right? So much of how we understand the system is about the history of preference in the Bonneville Power Act, right. the, his the history of building big projects together, the history of um, 
collaborative efforts yes. to connect to California through these big transmission lines. Um, and that's the history that informs. So the eras, eras, I think, is a great way of understanding our sector and um, a great way to close out our conversation with you. Yes, no, it was. And we're going to, we're going to, you're going to rank some analogies after this, but anything else you want to add before we really close it out? You know, both Paul, Crystal, really appreciate the time. Um, as always, this is number three. It's number three. Number three. So I'm looking forward to number four All right. at some point. You know, I want to I want to have the most guest appearances on your show. That's, <laughs> the, that's the goal there. <laughs> I, I, All right. We can achieve that goal. That is a goal I can achieve. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. There's competition for that. And, for sure. and I hope. I hope you want to come back because you feel valued and appreciated and seen and heard. That is my goal. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think it's an important um, podcast. Um, it's a great opportunity to talk about what's happening in the industry. And, you know, just today talking about what we're doing with West Tech and all of the value I think it's going to bring to the region and extra regionally, I, I think it's important. It's an important message to, to get out. So I really appreciate that. Great. Thank you. It's fun to talk about the enthusiasm that we have for this industry. Yeah. Yes, because we do, actually. And it comes through. We're yeah. enthusiastic about this industry. <laughs> Crystal, you're always valued and appreciated. Do you feel it? Yes, I do. Thanks for including me in this one. Okay. <laughs> well, now back to Almaz, Conley, and Farhad for more about energy enthusiasm. Woo woo. All right. Welcome back. Every, all, the, all the listeners just heard the wonderful interview with uh, John Harrison, CEO and administrator of the Bonneville Power Administration. Now we get to talk about that interview, which we've all heard already. Farhad Conley, any thoughts about, um, about, about, about the interview and what that means and his understanding of the investment needed and the people needed for that investment, um, what that means to the big, thick books you have read about transmission? Um, so I think uh, the challenge on the economics of transmission is one that I think um, tends to, it's, it's because you're talking about these assets which have traditionally, or you know, traditionally they're actually competitive, right? If you actually, um, I was, I was um, reading California Burning um, a, a couple of weeks ago and yep. it, it, was, it's, it was quite interesting to understand the early trans, sort of development of the transmission grid was, was competitive. And only after mergers and, and it sort of developed into these sort of big companies and, and um, licensed monopolies. Um, but of course, now you're kind of dealing with a situation where part of it's regulated. It might be privately owned, but regulated. It might be publicly owned, um, like like a Bonneville, I, I believe, is a, a public agency. That's right. One of four federal power marketing agencies. Seattle City Light, also publicly owned, also owns some transmission. Uh, and, and then you've got private uh, developers of transmission as well. So it's sort of the, you, you're bringing together a variety of parties with different incentives. Uh, and so I think that that sort of collaborative approach and, and really, I guess, in the economic world, it's probably something like a common pool uh, resource that that really it, it needs. It, it doesn't really neatly fit in this idea of, of market or, um, you know, the state should do it. It's sort of in the in this sort of murky netherworld. And I think that's one of the challenges. But but that does require a lot of collaboration. Uh, I want to talk a little bit more about the, uh, the uh, public goods versus common pool dynamic for transmission. Uh, but when you were talking about California burning, um, it made me think of last episode when we talked about competition for the market. And it seems like in the early stages of electric service, the transmission deployment and distribution deployment was the means for co competition for the market for electric service. Is that just a harebrained scheme or does that make sense? I think I think it um, it's that competition for the market versus competition in the market, and I guess if you have enough, um, if you if you don't have duplication, which is I think one of the fundamental and uh, reasons why these these entities have essentially now morphed into into licensed monopolies. But if you if you if you're not able to generate that level of dynamic competition. That's, I think, where some of the challenges of, of the economics comes in. And, and, and I think this idea of common pool is really important because it means that uh, it's something that does affect when, when someone makes a decision um, regarding investment or connecting to a, to a grid, it affects all of us. But uh, the, 
the economics are such that it's it's hard to necessarily allocate. And I think that was one of the challenges that John had pointed out in his interview is the issue of cost allocation, who bears the costs of different types of um, investments or different types of augmentations. How do you split those costs between the right parties? I know a lot of uh, researchers are working on this. I, I, I believe um, Jacob's also looking at, um, Professor Jacob Mays is looking at something like this as well. So um, there's going to be, I think there's going to be some really interesting work coming out of this area. So I, I thought the interview was great. It's nice to hear that there's a lot more money and interest coming into doing this kind of transmission upgrade planning. Um, something I would emphasize is that mostly in that interview, we were talking about centralized planning processes for transmission, right? And a big issue right now is, as Paul mentioned at the top of the show, the interconnection queue, which is a different kind of transmission upgrade, which are upgrades made when a generator is requesting to interconnect. And in a lot of systems, that's what we call uh, via the same terminology that the UK used back in 2010, the invest and connect approach, rather than say what ERCOT does right now, which is more a connect and manage approach. Um, and so I think there's a lot to talk about here as far as, as far had mentioned, aligning incentives, because right now, while we have this idea that we want the beneficiary to pay, when we're asking a new generator coming online to pay for the entirety of that upgrade, that's un it's unlikely that they are really the only beneficiary of that network being upgraded, right? So we kind of don't already have that to begin with. We also would like for them to be able to know what their cost is before they apply, right? And right now that's something that's really unpredictable and just drags out this process a lot. You get into the feedback loop of generators submitting multiple bids in the hopes that maybe one will be accepted. Um, and, you know, really at the crux of this, right, is in these markets that are doing this kind of invest and connect approach, I think a lot of it comes down to the way that they do their resource adequacy constructs, right? I think they're a bit trapped into it because if you say have a capacity market, which is zonal instead of nodal, but you have a nodal energy market, then you need your capacity resources to be deliverable in this zonal way, right? So you're doing all of these engineering interconnection studies to make sure that all that capacity could be delivered. When, you know, in the absence of that, you don't actually need this for the system to function. So say thinking in ERCOT system where you do see more of those full strength nodal spot prices, you know, the, the risk allocation I think is, is better. And we don't necessarily spend so much time doing these studies that again, every time something changes in that queue, you have to keep redoing them. So we're kind of stuck in this process. Yeah, what did you call the do loop? Like, is, do loop, is that what you referred to it, where the problem of there's a bunch of generators interconnecting because they need the most opportunity to win, and then that drives cost, and then is that... Yeah, I called it a feedback loop, right? Feedback it's like a, neg loop. a negative feedback loop. So, you know, you have this problem of all these generators in the interconnection queue, and because it's taking so long for them to actually get connected, they might submit multiple bids in the hopes that one of them will get accepted, which means if that one does, then they're going to withdraw those other bids. Now you got to redo all those interconnection studies. And so that's, you know, right now, a lot of work is being done on figuring out how do you simplify that interconnection process. But I think an alternative would be to think about moving away from that paradigm, saying that the generator needs to pay for the upgrade and we need to assume that they should be able to deliver their full capacity to saying, you know, we can connect you, there's some fee to connect you, and then we manage that risk some other way. I've heard stories and um, read articles about Australia's uh, rooftop solar industry being just cheap and fast and growing. Is there, do, does Australia address this topic differently than we do in the United States around interconnecting generation, not just rooftop to solar, but other types of generation? Uh, it does, and it's it's actually interesting. Is uh, and I think the the seeds and the motivation for this type of approach were actually borrowed um, or have a lot of alignment with uh, ERCOT and and the early CRES uh, competitive renewable energy zone development. Yeah. So uh, through this process of what uh, the, what's called the integrated system plan, the 
operator has identified a range of uh, the operators in the states have have identified a range of renewable energy zones and so what's happening today is there is the the regular way uh, transmission augmentation and, and net connection processes but a lot is actually happening in these renewable energy zones where there's almost a centralized planning and facilitated uh, investment for uh, um, facilitation of investment for transmission and interconnection and all of the associated uh, uh, additional services that you require to interconnect. So one of the aspects in the Australian grid in particular has been system strength. And so it's not just building more lines, but ensuring that there's sufficient grid strength through either the topology, but also building things like synchronous condensers. And so there's sort of a, a now a push towards trying to, you know, fast track or, or improve facilitation in these zones. Of course, the big question is what happens if you have an, a, a project outside of the zone? Um, but to me, that's also one interesting way because you could, start to, if you've got centralized planning, um, one of the interesting things that's done with some of these zones is they've gotten um, competition for the market in some ways for the transmission. So um, okay. they've basically bid it out to tender and, and um, selected a party, which may not necessarily be the incumbent or the monopoly in the state um, to um, develop a particular zone or a particular sub part of the zone. So I think that's kind of an interesting approach. And I'm, I, I, I guess one question is, is, is that something which, which could redevelop in the US and places like ERCOT and others? Because it is something which potentially addresses this issue of one party coming in, um, creating some sort of estimate around what it costs, someone else coming in, changing the dynamics in this sort of infinite loop uh, as, as Conley referred to. Negative feedback loop, I think, is where we're at on that, right, Conley? Yes. Um, well, I, I, so we interviewed Elliot Mainzer on Public Power on the Ground a couple years ago, the CEO of Kaiso, and his uh, answer to a question about the generator interconnection queue was that planning is the solution for the generator interconnection problem was his framing. And it's similar to the ERCOT example. And also, I think the MISO long-range planning multi-value project solution where you think about where and Kaiso did this in their long range look at look for I forget what they called it long range planning study as well where they looked for where generation was going to need to come from and started to plan for transmission to to bridge that gap um, but it is a centrally planned approach still because it's the uh, regional transmission organization that's doing that planning and i think i'm what i'm hearing is australia is also centrally planned zones that then get competitively bid for construction i think something that would be interesting to kind of come back to which is also will eventually tie back to australia um is this question of how generators have the right um incentive system to make investments. So right now, um, in liberalized markets in the US, we use something called financial transmission rights, which theoretically should be the way that you can have a hedge against a locational basis risk between the node you're at and some trading hub node. However, it seems that this isn't working, right? That this FTRs really don't show up in project finance. And that's probably partly because you don't necessarily get an FTR before you actually build the project, right? There's a lot about the price of getting connected that you don't know ahead of time. And I think that's an area where reform is needed. And maybe you would reform the FTR process, but there's also a proposal from uh, Jacob Mays is getting a lot of, uh, got a lot of attention in this <laughs> episode. Um, but I want to give a shout out to a paper from Jacob called Intercon Generator Interconnection, Network Expansion and Energy Transition. Um, I think we can link it in the show notes. Um, but this paper proposes giving a default hedge to generators that want to come online and that being a way of doing this connect and manage approach. So there's some fee that you would pay up front to interconnect and you'd know what that is. 
And then you have now a risk of, you know, you're not quite sure what your prices are going to be. You might be getting curtailed um, because of the transmission system as it is, but as it gets upgraded, maybe you would be curtailed less because those centralized planning processes now know you're actually there and are going to be able to do that more efficiently. Um, and I think this question of giving this kind of default hedge is interesting because that is not totally dissimilar to what Australia does now with the way it has a, um, Australia clears the market nodally in terms of its transmission constraints, but it gives a price that is really the reference price for a specific node in that system. So it's kind of like you're given a, a default hedge to some node in that network. And I'm curious what, what Farhad's thoughts are on that. Uh, I, th I think that's that's a that's a good observation because uh, when we talk about zonal versus nodal, uh, that that's actually doesn't really get to a lot of the discussion. Um, Australia's market is uh, a physically feasible clearing, which means if you clear the market, um, at least based on the most advanced understanding and constraints, you will get a solution that is physically implementable in the system as opposed to one which is purely based on uh, the merit order, if you like. So it is merit order cleared, but it's subject to the security and network constraints. Yeah. I'll um, give a quick shout out to the electrical engineers who might be upset with us for saying that it's a completely <laughs> feasible solution. Because of course, yes, like the idea is we're trying course. to get closer to that, but approximate or, or yeah. near, at least consider uh, it. At least consider it. Yeah. <laughs> Notwithstanding that, the prices are still regional. So you get essentially your regional reference node price. So if you're located in Victoria, regardless of what part of Victoria, you get something, you get essentially the, the regional reference node price um, for, for each particular region that you're based in. So that gives you a default hedge. It, it's not as, um, I guess, developed in the, in, in the uh, relative to that proposal on financial interconnection rights where there's not as specific a linkage between the fee you pay on entering the system and interconnecting into the system is linked to your um, basis price risk to that head, to that to that node, but it's got the similar it's got a similar uh, I guess uh, effect if you like. Mm -hmm. So so I think it's it's an it's an area that that is worthy of investigation because. Nodal risk uh, is is a big risk, and and in the same way that we talk about hedging for spot price risk, that when you when you're thinking about risk aversion and and in a in a, the real world where where you have risk averse financiers and 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 investors, participants don't necessarily want to take that risk, and so that affects your incentives to actually get get investment going. Um, so the more that you could do to at least provide options and and effective. Uh, options for hedging and charging for and and you know costs of hedging, so making sure that that's it's effectively valued. But the more that you open those up, the more you have an ability to actually get real world investment done uh, in a way that that investors can actually assess and and take that risk. One of the areas that John mentioned continuing research on or policymakers to think about was the economics, the cost allocation of these things. And we like dove into financial transmission rights and congestion as an element of the economics of these investments in, in markets. The other element, though, that he emphasized as an area for research that I actually was really keen to discuss a little bit more was um, understanding permitting. And in that interview, like we talked about the social science aspect of permitting and energy justice. Amaz, you you introduce yourself as an energy justice enthusiast. What did you take away from that conversation with John about the energy justice and permitting um, research to better understand and articulate those issues? Uh, well, just that, that he, he mentioned that there's a history of infrastructure um, builds like moving entire neighborhoods and, and recognizing the fact that uh, there are communities that are disproportionately impacted by some of these large infrastructure decisions. And so moving forward um, as we transition to the extent that we can find opportunities to, um, to change society, to improve people's conditions through the transit 
transition investments, um, energy transition investments, including transmission, then we should do that. He didn't mention this, but um, it, uh, gosh, months ago, I was listening to a, um, uh, a group talk about a a tribe in California, and I'm I'm not sure if I if I mentioned that on on this podcast yet, but the Morongo tribe of Indians, I believe, in California, who had a um, a, a an agreement with Southern California Edison for transmission to go through their um, reservation, and when the 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 agreement was up and it was time, you know, Southern California Edison thought they were just going to come in and and redo everything, and of course the the, the tribe has had been um, treated very uh, unfairly in that original agreement, and they were they were ready to negotiate, and um, and fortunately they did, and they ended up negotiating 50% ownership in that transmission going through there. So they, they uh, in, in that process, so Southern California Edison, if they, had they not been able to go through that, that property, they would have had to go around. It would have been more costly. So they saved money by, by going through that property, but the tribe benefited in, in having ownership. And so um, as, as we go through this transition and yes, they're going to be there now, the only, the only transmission, uh, you know, native tribal transmission owners in the U.S., but I would love to see like those types of, of things like in, in the past where we've seen communities that were uh, negatively harmed by our transmission or by any part of our, our energy system. Uh, moving forward, we can we can actually mitigate that and and um, and make up for it. So that I'm hoping to see more of that. And I and I think that's kind of what he he didn't say that example explicitly, but that's what I understood from him. You know, we gave a shout out to Jacob Mays, who's doing uh, advanced research on the economics of this question. We should give a shout out equally to researchers doing good work on the energy justice aspect of transmission and transmission planning. Do you have anybody off the top of your head? Or I've, I've got at least a couple. Anybody you want to shout out on us? Oh, any t- energy justice? And that's research, no. research. Oh, yeah, she's a researcher. No, I yeah, no, no, yeah. I cut you off before you like landed the punch. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, Destiny Knock, obviously. <laughs> Um, Anyone else though? Oh my gosh, you're putting me on the spot because I, I know I, you know I don't do names very well, but um, many many folks in the uh, energy justice space, um, some of her students that have just graduated are are, are um, phenomenal in this space as well. Um, we've got our folks at the national labs. I was just at um, the last month. I was in D.C. Department of Energy and the national labs got together. Um, and held an energy justice, energy equity workshop. And they invited you know, different folks. I was there representing the, the utility perspective, but they wanted to, to, to showcase what all the, all the research the lab is doing in the way of energy justice. And my mind was blown. I, there's so much uh, research happening that most of us don't even know is, is going on. But um, I'm I'm currently twisting some national lab researchers' arms to get them to um, to do a, 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 a kind of a roadshow kind of thing to to uh, be cool. that work to the utilities. Sorry, uh, I don't Je- have names. I just have I just tell you that there's a lot of stuff happening in the national labs. Uh, Jen Yashimura, I think from Pacific Northwest National Lab. I think we course, we tried to Jen. get her on the underground before. She's great. Um, Aaron Baker has done she co-authored a bunch of works with Destiny Knock. Um, I would love to get her on the podcast. I tried to get her up to uh, Northwest Pope Power Association's Power Supply Conference last year. She does uh, great work that I've read. Anybody else uh, that we should, Farhad, Conley, anybody Tony else, Reeves. as I'm saying names? Tony Reeves. What was that about? The, Professor Tony Reeves. He was the number two to um, Shalonda Baker. Uh, he has officially returned to academia. So we will say Tony Reeves. He's no longer with the Department of Energy. Nice. Any other takeaways from the interview? Are we ready to talk about the analogies that they propose? I'm sorry. Last thing that we we didn't mention, and I'll just briefly say it. We don't have to dive in it too much. He talked about how the the, the shift away from non-wires alternatives to transmissions. Like when I first entered the industry, that's all we were talking about um, in terms of anyway, uh, when Bonneville was talking, it was the non-wires alternatives. Um, but I heard him mention now, like the, it, there's the, the switch, like that, that was the, the, like the, the band-aid to get sort of get you through, but now it's like hardcore uh, transmission investments. And a question that's always been on, uh, in my head is how, that, that balance between non-wires alternatives and 
and your large scale transmission investments. And I wonder, it seems like we have planning that, that does these non-wires alternatives, planning for the, the large transmission, but optimizing between those two um, is something that I, that I still wonder. Um, folks who are proponents for distributed energy resources, like our, our friend Lorenzo Christoph will, say, will tell you, you don't need that much transmission if you would just have more distributed energy resources. But that, that, that type of planning, uh, I have not seen. Um, and so I, I was just uh, interested when he talked about that pivot away from NWA, uh, non wires alternatives to uh, transmission. But we, yeah, that's all. We can go ahead and move on from there. I was actually just going to give a quick shout out to Professor Erin Mayfield as well at Dartmouth. Uh, she's done some good work on um, the interaction between social equity and planning too. So there's there's some really interesting work on that because I think that that the biggest the sort of the challenge of how you quantify those kind of non monetary costs too I think is is a really important challenge. Okay, let's hit the typewriter and check on the. Energy system analogies, ESSA World Cup standings from the qualifying qualifying round. First of all, uh, anybody, any comments on the two analogies that I thought were absolutely wonderful? <laughs> the golf analogy from John Harrison and the um, Taylor Swift. The electric yeah. sector is evolving like the air is a Taylor Swift. Well done. Just well done. Um, yeah. It'd be very competitive. Very competitive. This is gonna be this is gonna be a, a hard a hard tournament. Uh, gosh, yeah, we're... Up our game. Yeah. I think there's some there's got to be some memes coming out of this, right? Yeah, I'll, we need more memes. That's for sure. <laughs> and here's the, it was funny when she said that when she mentioned the song "Never Ever Getting Back Together." Let me tell you, I have not thought about that song. I I heard it before. I've not thought about it, but it's gonna be in my head now just because she brought it up. <laughs> Every time you think about the energy transition now, that, that oh. lyric is going to play in your head. Well, with the first one, which you did not see as part of with the clip I shared with you, um, we have the electric sector is like backcountry skiing is in the lead after a tiebreaker with the grid is like oh. air. So those are our top two in the standings. The grid is like the human body came in number third. Fourth is electric utilities are the PID control system of the electric grid. Farhad, you had a tied, your analogy is tied for fifth in the scoring. Um, the water catchment irrigation system and Mumbai double wallet Tiffin service tied at five. The electric sector is like a game of Twister. Uh, people don't like the people, like John nor Crystal really like Twister. I think that is coming in as bias against your analogy, Conley. And then nobody likes that our ways of understanding the grid are like moral theories. It, no, we don't have any buyers yet, um, which is fair. It's maybe not the best analogy. Definitely going to lose to the heirs of Taylor Swift. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't going to let them vote on their own. Like the court, I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to do that. So now when we, if you, we all have this chance and this is your chance. If you had a new analogy or wanted to inform your analogy more, now's a chance. And then in futures, you could have a new analogy included in the voting. Like I should have come up with one instead of my moral theories one, because it's not going to win. Um, but I didn't do that. Anybody have any additions to their theories or their analogies or additions to the field? Uh, you know what? First of all, I I I loved his analogy. Uh, well, you asked me, did, did, did anything uh, impact mine? I loved his talk about uh, the need for collaboration. And, when, and in my body analogy, uh, I feel like there is some opportunity to expand on how um, in keeping a body healthy, you kind of need a village. Um, so you, like, we do depend on other people to, uh, if you're not a farmer, you're depending on a farmer to grow your food. If you're not a doctor, and even if you are a doctor, maybe you need a doctor to keep you healthy. So um, the, the health of, your, of, the, of the body overall does rely a lot on collaborating with other uh, other other uh, entities other people um, and so that that was how that that was how I wouldn't necessarily change it but I could add a little bit strengthen that body analogy through um, uh, his uh, his reference of the the, the grid and transmission in general needing a lot of collaboration to, to make it successful 
Yeah, collaboration, the theme. So uh, Rob Gramlich, the grid strategies uh, report that we referenced in short to ground did dovetail, I think, with the conversation with John around collaboration and coalition building. I like my current ranking. Well, you're, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't I think be smart to change gonna... a winning strategy. <laughs> I think I'm okay. going to have some more sports ones or like pop music <laughs> ones or something. Yeah, I think you need to come up with a pop music one, Farhan. I think that's a good idea. Or uh, yeah, I need to come up with one too. I'm 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 right there with you. Okay, well, in our next episode, episode we'll have a discussion of distribution system engineering with the inspiring Francis Sammy. We'll get his practitioner perspective on what the energy transition means to a distribution engineer, and ask him to rank our analogies, including John and Crystal's analogies. So we'll have a we'll have more in the field and more rankings next time. But before I close it out, I just wanted to say thank you to my co-hosts. I hope you see, feel seen, heard, valued, and appreciated. Conley, did this feel good this week? Yes. Farhad, do you feel seen, heard, valued, and appreciated? Absolutely. Amaz, do you did you feel good this week? Are you feeling good? Feeling good? I do. I do. Good. To our listeners, while you aren't seen or heard, you are valued and appreciated. Roll on, enthusiasts. Roll on. We started in hard times to bring us all in. Into the laughter through thick and through thin. For public power enthusiasts with... Public Power Underground is a production of News Data and Seattle City Light. You don't have to be subscribed to News Data's weekly newsletter to get this podcast, but it sure makes the podcast make a lot more sense. The views expressed here are own and not the official views of Seattle City Light, Tacoma Power, S&P Global, News Data, or the organization of the guests also appearing on Public Power Underground. Today's episode was written, produced, and produced by Paul Dockery, Almaz Nagesh, Conley Byers, and Farhad Bilamoria. And it's edited and published by the stellar team at Pioneer Utility Resources with sound mixing by Lucas Smith and video editing by Brendan Delzer. Our theme song, Roll On Enthusiast, was rewritten, performed, and recorded by Aaron Guillory and Ian Bledsoe. You can find Public Power Underground on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Please share with electric utility enthusiasts like us and give us a rating and review on your app of choice if you enjoyed the content. It helps other energy enthusiasts like us find us. Public Power Underground for electric utility enthusiasts. Public Power Underground, it's work to watch.